guys and welcome back to Scandinavian Design 101. I'm Sanna. I'm Andreas and we are two Swedes and we really love all kind of design. We do. Um, and today we're going to talk about one of the greatest designers active in the 20th century Denmark. Finn Juhl. Mm, my favorite. Yeah, but he was not alone. Together with colleagues like Hans J. Wegner, Arne Jakobsen, Börje Mogensen, Kåre Klint, yeah. Paul Kärholm and Imko Fotlarsen, he represent the golden age in Denmark. Yeah, that's a lot of huge names. <laughs> it really is, but our favorite is perhaps Finn Juhl. He is. Finn Juhl was born on the 30th of January in 1912 in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, if you didn't know that. His mother died only three days after his birth, leaving him and his older brother with their father, who was a wealthy textile merchant. Growing up, Yule took an interest in fine arts and wanted to study art history, but his father advised him to instead study architecture. So he enrolled at the Department of Architecture at the Royal Academy of Arts, and this was in the beginning of the 30s, the time when modern design emerged. In 1934, when Juhl was still a student, he got a job at prominent architect Wilhelm Lauritsen's studio, and the two would come to have a close collaboration for 14 years. Finn got to work on major projects, for example the Copenhagen airport, and was so busy that he didn't finish his studies. No. Despite this, he became a member of the Danish Architects Association in 1942, <laughs> okay. so it wasn't that important. No. <laughs> Who cares about Who cares? academics? <laughs> On the 15th of July, 1937, Jul married Ingemarie Skarup. Is yeah. that how you pronounce it? Skarup, I think. Skarup? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. 1937 was also the year he for the first time exhibited his furniture at the annual Cabinet Makers Guild yeah. exhibition. These exhibitions wanted to encourage collaborations between designers and cabinet makers to create modern, high-quality furniture. So, Juhl came to collaborate very successfully with cabinet maker Nils Wodder for many years, creating some of the most amazing pieces of furniture you'll ever see. <laughs> yeah, they are absolutely astonishing. And as a furniture designer, Finn Juhl always started the process by measuring and studying his own body. Uh, a chair should, according to him then, uh, be considered an extension of the human body, fully adapted for its purpose. But he did not relate to the functionalist moment. The shape was never determined just by function. Instead, he worked like a sculpture, creating shapes rarely seen at the time. Um, when many of his colleagues embraced the streamlined minimalist aesthetics, uh, yeah, you all know what, what, what that looks like. I mean, Juhl often preferred organic shapes inspired by painters like Magritte and Dali. Um, and in 1939 1940, he showed his organic upholstered furniture to the public for the first time. And they were often given animal names, <laughs> like the pelican chair uh, he designed in 1940. And with its wing-shaped backrest, it looks like a pelican uh, painted by Dali. Uh, but Juhl wasn't at all inspired by a bird when he designed the pelican. Instead, it was the human torso that in inspired him. The wings are actually um, arms, uh, possible to lean against, uh, making the chair, I mean, both comfortable and good-looking. And that's the difference between a functionalist and Finn Juhl. It's very important that furniture should be good looking. Mm. Uh, and typical for the organic furniture he designed um, is that they often, uh, he often made openings in the backrest. For example, in the sofa FDA 50. And this is not just a design feature. Uh, the openings made it more comfortable to lie down in the sofa with one arm hanging through. <laughs> and uh, soon these openings uh, got even bigger, as seen in the Baker sofa he designed uh, in 1951. And here the opening on the backrest is hovering, uh, not the opening, but the, the top of the backrest is hovering above the rest of the sofa as a separate element. 
like a sky, some people have said. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. But Finul is not only uh, known for heavy upholstered furniture. A few years later, he started making furniture constructed in the complete opposite way, <laughs> as skeletons showing all of the framework. Here, Yule was inspired by predecessors like the Bauhaus architects, but in contrary to them, he valued craftsmanship, craftsmanship and exclusive materials. Hmm. The result was lightweight but very stable furniture with elegant expressions. At the Cabinet Makers Guild exhibition in 1949, he showed one of his most remarkable designs, we mm -hmm. think. Yeah. The chieftain chair. Hmm. It was inspired by tribal art, and the booth at the exhibition hmm. was also decorated with, with tribal artifacts. Yeah. It looked cool. It was very cool. <laughs> Also at the exhibition, he showed the Egyptian chair, mm. inspired by an ancient Egyptian chair he had seen at the Louvre Museum. Oh, let's not discuss how, no. how we pronounce the French thing. No, we... <laughs> Both the chieftain and the Egyptian chair shows how Yule borrowed shapes from historic times, mm. but transformed them into modernist furniture. Yeah, let's take a look at some of these furniture. In 1942, Yule and his wife built their own home just north of Copenhagen. The house is kind of L-shaped with yeah. the open plan and was filled with his own furniture and many artworks by Danish painters. And we, we Google mapped it just yesterday. Yeah. And you can walk through it. In Google Maps. Yeah, inside the house. Inside the house. So that's a very good tip. So take a you look at Google because then you can visit the house yeah. uh, interactively. <laughs> it was so cool. Yeah. You and Ingemarie got divorced and you would come to live in the house with his new partner, Hanne Wilhelm Hansen, till his death in 1989. In 1945, after leaving Wilhelm Lauritsen's studio, he opened his own design studio with a focus on furniture and interior design. Which soon got very successful, of course. Yeah. 
And between 1945 and 55, he also worked as senior teacher at the School of Interior Design. Yeah, even though he had no he, teaching he, experience. No, he dropped out, out of school himself. But yeah, he was a great architect at least. <laughs> and his international breakthrough uh, came in 1950, 1951, when he came in contact with Edgar Kaufmann at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And Kaufmann had visited Denmark in 1948 and got highly impressed with Jules' furniture and he came to introduce his furniture in the US. And MoMA propagated for organic design and the shapes of Jules' furniture suited the American taste very well, perhaps better than some of his other colleagues in Denmark. Um, this soon resulted in a col uh, collaboration with the Michigan-based uh, company Baker's Furniture, who came to produce Jules Furniture in the US. And the owner of Baker's, Hollis Baker, had read about Finn Jul in the press and invited him to also design a whole collection of furniture for his company. And at the same time, he got the highly prestigious commission to design the Trusty Ship Council's chamber at the United Nations headquarters, which was about to be built in New York. Mm. Um, and it was a bit surprising that Finn Juhl was selected for this important job, because the 38-year-old Dane had only at this point designed two buildings in his entire career. Mm. But the result was, of course, highly successful. And the, the interaction between the room, the furniture, and also the colors is very typical for interiors by Yule. Uh, and most spectacular in this case is probably the ceiling. Um, it was made to look like flags hanging down from the ceiling and was inspired by abstract artists like Mondrian. And in this construction, both ventilation and lighting was hidden without the use of a conventional inner ceiling, which can be quite boring. Very boring. <laughs> yeah. And the chamber, uh, to this chamber, he designed a chair that came to be known as FN Stolen, or the United Nations chair. Um, and it was produced in Denmark by master cabinet maker Nils Wodder, but also in the US by this baker's furniture. Also important for Finjur's international success was his collaboration with the airline company SAS, Scandinavian Airlines. Yeah. With a start in 1956, he was commissioned to design the company's ticket offices around the world. By using an architect like Finjur, SAS wanted to get a modern profile associated with good Scandinavian design. Yeah. In the following years, he designed the interiors of as many as 33 terminals in cities like Tokyo, Nairobi and Alexandria. Hmm. He also designed the interior of seven DC-8 airliners in the same manner as the terminal. Yeah, and uh, this is... Uh, I mean, it's very uh, interesting to see uh, photos from these terminals because you see this most exclusive furniture <laughs> in, in, in them and uh, I mean... That's the way you want to travel. <laughs> yes, it is. But in later years, Finjul got more mainstream, adapted his furniture for serial production at companies like Franz und Averkusen. And in the 50s, he did design several successful pieces of furniture for this company. For example, the Japan Sofa and Easy Chair. And that's a very good looking, even though it's a bit simpler than some mm. of his earlier furniture. Um, and the commercial success in the 60s was the Diplomat series. Uh, series. It, series. Uh, adapted for use in offices and public spaces. Um, that is boring. Yeah, it, it is boring. <laughs> it was popular in offices around the world, but I mean, as you see, the shape is not very exciting at all. Um, as most of his furniture designed in the 60s and 70s, I mean, it, it lacked the originality and quality that otherwise uh, made Finn Juhl so extremely successful. Mm. And according to the Danish art historian uh, Henrik Vivell, at least uh, his r last really interesting piece of furniture uh, was a bedroom interior exhibited at the Copenhagen Cabinet Makers Guild exhibition already in 1961. And I totally agree, because the things he did in the 60s and 70s is not the things he should be remembered for. And, and that's he a bit, isn't. No, he isn't. But it's a bit sad that he didn't 
designed any really good stuff in his late career. Can't be awesome all the time. No. Finjul, uh, like I said earlier, died in mm. 1989, but his furniture are still being produced today and are still very appreciated <laughs> and sought after all yeah. around the world. And therefore, his furniture will cost you a lot of money. Yes. And this was our introduction to yeah. Finjul. We will, we will t- of course, in the future talk about uh, some of his furniture. because of this, So much to learn. Yeah, this is our number one favorite, I think, because it's... Good looking and good quality and uh, you just want them all and you can't buy them all. <laughs> or possibly. No. <laughs> and thanks for uh, watching. Thank you. And if you like this video, please click thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Yes. And if you like Scandinavian design and modern design as much as we do, please follow us on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're called Scandinavian Design 101 and we have daily posts about design. Thanks for watching. Thank you.